Good evening, Uganda, and welcome to On The Spot. My name is Patrick Kamara. Tonight, my guest is the leader of opposition, the Honorable Matthias Impuga. He's made two years and a half as leader of opposition and still counting. But he has also been traversing the country to understand and hear from the people of Uganda what their societal problems could be. What we know is that some members of the opposition have disappeared without a trace. Some cases have been lodged at the Uganda Human Rights Commission and Parliament. But in Parliament, we have seen a lot of walkouts. What does that mean? Today, National Unity Platform was unable to officially open their newly constructed headquarters in Kampala. We'll be looking into all these and many more. Honorable Matthias Puga, a warm welcome to you. Thank you, Patrick, for having me. Thank you, too, for having honored the invitation to come here. All the pleasure to be here. Uh, let me, maybe you deserve a congratulations as National Unity Platform because you've been able in a short time to build your headquarters in a prime land in Kampala when we have some parties that have been around for some time plus those in power and those who have not yet been able to test power, struggling to build their headquarters. So the congratulatory message is very deserving. Congratulations. Thank you, Patrick. Probably it speaks to our, our sense of commitment as uh, a young party to try to do things that people probably think are improbable. Uh, but also speaks to the fact that um, if we had had opportunity to have the... Um, you know, the power of the state, you probably could have fixed this country. You don't need to have generations of time to fix a broken country if you have commitment. And uh, we're giving the nation a peek into our humble abilities if given space and time and uh, basic resources. It's so a, a lesson of local ingenuity. It's a lesson of being frugal. It's a lesson of the capacity to mobilize resources amongst yourselves and wherever in a short time. And how did you pull it off? Well, uh, first of all, we fully understand the space into which we operate. And um, we also know for a fact that um, a, a lot of uh, naysayers did not give us a chance to even last a year, you recollect um, when we, we, just, we first came into Parliament, everyone, including the media, was dismissive of our capacity. But in this, um, kudos to the team at the Secretariat, the commitment of uh, the members, the commitment of um, our colleagues at Parliament. Everyone is very committed to building this young organization, and it takes duty, sacrifice, to be able to pull off that. It's not easy. Because uh, if you have re little resources, we could have settled for comfort in the short term. But I believe we needed to give our membership the kind of promise, the nation. You know, three months at our investiture, the people didn't trust us. I contend still that we won the last election. There was no mean fit. So it was. It's, a it's, on, it's on that point where Honorable Mathias and Puga, with all respect, that we but that we don't agree. But that, that's what I'm saying. We don't have to agree. But I, I mean, I, I have a right to state what I believed happened. Okay. Because on another day, if I asked you how many of us we got, I'm sure you will not tell. At least I have an idea of what we got. But that's another day. I was just trying to. I, I don't want to go that. Confirm. I don't want to get into that rabbit hole. No, but that's because why, that's because, why I'm, I'm because the numbers speak volume on the Mathias and no, we, we have been, been like 59 Patrick, members of parliament, almost of a house of 500, a few LC5 chairpersons in a district in, in a country of 144 districts, a few LC5, LC3 chairperson in a country of thousands. Patrick, it's, it's hard to believe. State it's a hard fact. sell. State one fact. Was that a free and fair election? Did that reflect the will of the people of Uganda? So in you, your humble view, so you won as even in an unfair. You won even in an unfair against election. Against odds. You, ag against all odds. Yes. The, the numbers are in your favor. Against odds, we were able to compute the numbers, and we know what happened. 
Would you call that a free and fair election? So all those people who were able to elect almost over 400 members of parliament from the other side, when it came to the presidential election, they ticked Robert Chagulani. Patrick, you know for a fact that the Honorable Chagulani won the Busoga sub-region by over 75%. No doubt about that. And only a single MP was declared. You think those people are insane? So you, you, want us to you that? believe you believe you carried the day because you took Kampala and took Busoga? No, Patrick, Uganda, Uganda is have, have Uganda some, is more than Busoga and Kampala, Matthias. I do. Respect. I have a lot of respect have for what respect. you are able to achieve in a are short you, while. Are you not aware that our agents were arrested and our DR forms confiscated in Acholi, in Lango, in Teso? You're not aware. Are you a tourist? You occupy very credible space in the public media, Patrick. Are, are you not alive to these uh, facts? Sure. I, I know of an uneven ground in which on which you are operating. Yeah. I know that there were some electoral malpractices. So, uh, so they even, they even, they even, they, they even no, no, no. They even, no, but you, you know, because I'm looking at the numbers. I, I mean, all those members of parliament. The falsified numbers? No, no, no. Are you saying all those MPs in, in Acholi, in, in, in West Nile? Did I say they, all? I don't have to have all. No. I'm not speaking about all. I'm talking about the facts. You are really fixated. You are really fixated, Your Honorable Matthias and Puga, that you won the election. The fixation is because we did ask for an audit. Did it happen? If you decline an audit, what, are you, what are you hiding? You went to court. And what happened in the court? You forgot. You decided to give, even to leave court did before. You, did the court give us a chance to let bear what happened? You walked away. So what did you do in the face of inhibitions? artificially raised in your face. You decide... They were never natural In the beginning, you have confidence in the court. When the process starts, you decide to walk away. No, Patrick, we're talking about a presidential... The pendulum shift... Uh, come on, listen. We're talking about a presidential petition. And you're aware the stakes were, not, uh, were as high as they can come. And of course, you know the implications of the opposition with all the facts at their disposal being given time to petition and let bear all the evidence. You actually understand that up to now, we have some of our agents who bore their forms. These have cases. They were arrested and charged with all manner of uh, offenses. OK. Um, Do you want us to go into that detail? Because we have digressed, we have digressed at the very beginning, which is not a good no, thing. No, it is the essence of this conversation. The discussion you see in Parliament, we've just introduced, is actually an extension of the injustices, is actually an extension I'm, I'm, of I'm, the I'm, illegalities. I'm just from congratulating you for having pulled off something fundamental, building yourselves a, a party headquarters yeah. in a short time as a young party, which is a congratulation I say this is deserving. But I also understand you are meant to have been able to open officially your party headquarters today. Yeah. That didn't happen. Sure. What happened? Well, uh, you probably have had uh, enough, as I did, that um, in the warped wisdom of um, our security agencies, the NUP cannot hold an internal function within its premises to open their offices when General Seveni is uh, three kilometers away from that site. That as long as General Seveni is in the Kawempe division, all political actors must stay in abeyance. That's the wisdom of uh, Uganda security agencies. And uh, like I said, in their warped wisdom, they uh, decreed that we can't be there. And uh, in our fair judgment, we didn't want to expose uh, our guests to, in to the insanity of our security agencies. Uh, we said, let's retreat. We said, we'll have it tomorrow. Because, um, I, I have seen on NTV uh, spokespersons of the police speaking to nothing but politics, claiming that uh, we need their permission to open up their offices, and now none of them is quoting any law or any even a regulation to that effect. That's why I said that this conversation is an extension of what is becoming a sense of uh, uh, rule by the uh, by the jungle. It's jungle rule. 
if you're going to wake up every day and make proclamation that I have no space in law and common sense, then um, there's a very big problem in how this country is being governed. But we contend that that's part of the, the attempt to, to, to take away power from the people. It's a rehearsal of, of a power grab so, by men in uniform, and uh, we have a duty to resist that. So now, they gave you a reason the president was in the vicinity, in the area or in the neighborhood, uh, and now you want to open tomorrow, but they're telling you you haven't gotten the permission. So, what, I mean, have you asked what is it exactly? Because if we, today we, was a different reason, then tomorrow... We don't have to ask, because uh, we are well clothed with the law. We know what the law says. Um, and uh, I did expect you people in the media to ask them to tell you under which law uh, do they expect us to get permission from them. We are a registered political party, and therefore we are doing a legitimate activity of uh, a political party. And the law clearly prescribes situations that do not require anybody's, you know, uh, actually there's no law requiring police to give anybody permission. So in your view, this is political persecution? It's, it's just not, I mean, to say persecution is even another statement. It is an attempt to overthrow. Uh, uh, the constitutional rule in this country. We've been trying to, to really think through the options when the constitution is overthrown. Even when you think that it's one off and then you realize that it's becoming a pattern, then you have to think through what you're going through. So the police and uh, attendant security agencies have no basis to lay claim to to even advise, if we needed them in our internal matter, we would have asked of their support. It's purely an NUP matter, and a few guests we have invited. Within the lockup of our premises, we don't need them. Okay, so, so tomorrow you're attempting... But why didn't you invite me with the police spokesperson to come here and inform the country? By the way, I should tell you that uh, uh, the Honorable Boer was supposed to be here. There was an attempt. To, 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 to invite. I think he, yeah, I think he had agreed, but on the last hour, he, 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 he sent his, his regret. So I, I don't want this monologue. I want really to, to have people. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's, what, that's right? what I'm saying. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Uh, according to my producer, the minister was invited. Not the minister. The honourable boy was invited. He accepted, but at the last hour, I think he sent his regret. That's why you are alone. But probably so, in the fear of defending the indefensible. I do not know, but I'm trying to say NTV has made an effort in trying to balance this, the discussion to have the person from the NRM there. Will you and answer for them? No, you have your own things to answer. Why? I'm in the business of asking questions. Yeah, if you can't <laughs> answer, then I have a problem. Some I'm, of the questions will be kind I'm, I'm in the business of asking questions. <laughs> I'm not in the business of, of answering questions. In fact, I, I don't even do answer questions. So. Uh, Tomorrow you, you are tempting to maybe to open your, your, your offices, but if they haven't, then that's a... An attempt would mean that we are, we are trying to do something <laughs> illegal, and therefore testing the system. There's nothing illegal. Because, because you, 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 attempt, you tried today, you couldn't, so you're hopeful tomorrow you will. It was our but own decision There is today. a precedent that whenever police says no, then confrontation ensues, and before you know it, some people are injured. You, that's a question that should go to the police, not me. We shall wake up tomorrow to go and undertake a legitimate activity of our party and do it the way we know it, in peace and harmony. And whoever wants to disrupt our peace, that's their business. They can do it and then we tell the country whether they were acting within the law and whether in their <coughs> space uh, common sense is an alien uh, word. Is your party where you are a member, the National Unity Platform, mm -hmm. still having the vibrancy and the momentum that it had two, three years ago? I'm saying this because I've listened from some pundits who think, well, the shine is getting off. How, what do you tell them? Depending on their knowledge of uh, political oscillations, uh, because um, vibes, whatever you want to call it, have seasons. In this kind of environment, the party is organizing, the party is recruiting, the party is orienting, the party is deploying. 
And when the time comes for real to show what he'd been doing over the last so many years, then it will show. Uh, I hope you did see um, what happened when uh, our party president, the Honorable Michagulanyi, went to want to mobilize the country. Uh, well, then that reassuring enough. And there was no vote. There was no competition. But just to greet the people and assure them that the NUP is still on course, in your view, was that an act that portrayed us as weak or, re or even nose diving? I think as a young organization, we are going through the stages of growth. And I have no doubt that we shall undergo, you know, through the challenges that all organizations go through until we are able to be talked about as a, a, an old, seasoned, and experienced organization. At this stage, we are training our cadres. We are identifying, emerging leaders within the party. We are trying to weigh and see competences of our membership. We are even recruiting seasoned politicians in our rank and file as a young organization. It does not happen one day that you have all that it takes. It's a process. We are determined to undergo through that process, and we know what it takes. And uh, from where we gone from two plus years ago, we are in very good space, and I'm not worried about the future of NUP. I have seen opposition walkouts from parliamentary sessions once or twice. I know there's some disagreements that happen on the floor, but, but when you walk out as members of parliament in the opposition, what is the walking out meant to achieve? You know, Patrick, it's because um, since independence, Ugandans have been on the run, and they have never tested a true democratic environment and process. In democracies, Walkouts are normal. And um, when it happens, and after explaining why, you expect your adversary, your adversaries to go in their backyard and think through why you walked out. Walkouts are more democratic than uh, you've seen uh, Houses of Parliament members throwing punches at each other. In 1980, the group that did not, not walk out of parliament walked to the tall grass. And we all know what happened when they walked to the bush. Was well, that more democratic in your view? It's our choice to show discontent. It's our choice. We believe that's a decent way of showing discontent without necessarily being disruptive, without necessarily um, uh, causing uh, harm so, so it's to a, our adversaries. Considering what you're saying, you're trying to act normal in a normal situation. And so what are you saying exactly? You said that uh, walking out you, should not be an option. So is that a problem? <coughs> I was saying, what, what, does it, what is it likely to achieve for you? What does it bring on the table? What has it achieved? Why is parliament in recess now? You think it's normal, recess, in your view? And you see the bigger question and why I don't like this monologue. You would, I would have had Comrade Hampson be able to explain to the country whether, in his view, they would rather be alone than having us in the house. And therefore, they are portrayed as more democratic. When we legitimately go to the house and ask <coughs> questions, and demand for answers over matters that legitimately need to be supplied with answers for the contentment, for the comfort of the nation, and no answers are supplied. That not once, not twice, we raise questions, and the Prime Minister is not able to answer, and all the ministers are mute, and therefore should allow business to continue as usual, so instead of carrying away the mess, <coughs> mm -hmm. or even uh, you know, standing on tables, we walk out. It's decent. It sends a message to those to all can, that can listen and answer. Say, hey, 
the entire NRM, I hear calling themselves the mass party, in the entire mass party, no one has capacity to come and respond to the six issues I raised on behalf of the opposition on the floor, namely the fate of the 18 missing persons. But as I speak, I think they're now 20 because I'm getting even more. Two, the trial of civilians in military courts against the ring of the constitutional court. Three, detention without trial. I think we had from our checkered political history returning to our fore while we were observing. Four, violation of human rights in fishing communities. Five, the shrinking civic space. And six, the choice of the state to persecute Muslim communities. We even gave examples of shooting at Muslim clerics while on handcuffs. And we were demanding for answers. We even mentioned ministers which will come and explain. <coughs> mm -hmm. It is too much for a government of four years that when these questions are asked, somebody stands and dismisses these questions, yet we have families demanding for their dear ones arrested by state agencies. One, two, three, four years. Not in court, no non detention center, and you think we should simply look on? By the way, you a citizen, what would you advise the opposition to do in the face of that? I'm not a politician. You're a citizen? Um, yeah, I'm not a politician. Yeah. You're Ugandan who and, can uh, legitimately advise. And, uh, and, and what, what I know is that uh, for a person like you who has legitimate concerns, the respect of fellow members of parliament, even across the aisle, the power of persuasion and debate, I would hope you stand your ground and be able to put your, your, your points across. You're a very persuasive person, and the, the power of the argument wins the day. That's what we call the politics. Patrick, do you want to play for the viewers how I debated and raised the issues? in this program so that you can know that you were speaking to obstinate individuals on the right of the speaker, the obstinacy compelled us to say, hey, I think these people are slumbering away. Probably a workout will wake them up. So, so you, they are very serious you stand on the floor of parliament, you use all your, your persuasive power, your articulation as we know it, it doesn't work. You hit the dead end, you get out of parliament, it doesn't work, you hit the dead end. So uh, the people in Yendo uh, and in Kenjo will be asking, what else can the Honorable Matthias Mpuga do and his colleagues? You know, Patrick, you don't have a toolbox of answers uh, that, you know, we open and pull out this and another trick. But we hand reach as they arise. We expect a response from government on these issues. And I suppose um, in the wisdom of the presiding officer, they need a break. And I want to credit the presiding officer for affording a break to government because initially uh, the prime minister had asked for 30 days to respond, which we rejected. And um, when the speaker did ask whether they were ready to respond, they didn't seem ready to respond. He gave them a second week to see whether they would come with answers. The issues remained, and I'm very sure the presiding officer considered these questions legitimate, that answers must be supplied. We I think in his judgment thought that probably these people should be forced to retreat and come back with answers. So, so do, we are you, waiting. do you have, as you wait, do you have, uh, probably not say this, but do you have any trick up your sleeve? that you are able to put on the table because um, the options available to you with all respect to Honorable Matthias have not worked? Well, I said we don't have a toolbox. But when matters arise, we convene as leaders in parliament, as a caucus of the opposition, as the shadow cabinet, and mull over these issues and uh, devolve, um, um, evolve options. And when these options come to, to bear, we go to the house. In most cases, we, we raise and seek audience with the presiding officer 
to see whether we shall have space to ask our questions differently and offer government an opportunity to come clean on these issues. Because as I speak, I think the government uh, looks extremely shabby. Uh, first of all, to simply remain obstinate and fail to come and respond to questions that are in the public domain. The issue of missing persons has been in our faces for the last more than two years. Because you have seen, I've seen stories of these, heard stories of these families on NTV. Even this week, I saw these stories on this TV. Someone should come and account okay. for their actions. Honorable. This is not personal to Matthias and Poga and his group. Honorable, Honorable Matthias, hold on to your points, sir, because we're going to take a break when we come back. Let's look into deeply the issue of the missing persons or supporters of the National Unity Platform. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Kamara. My guest tonight is the leader of opposition, the Honorable Matthias Mpoga. You began by telling us a story that is sad, and of course a story I've heard about your members, the supporters of Loop, who have been missing or abducted by state agencies. And, and you quote about the number about 20 or 18. But about two weeks ago, I met the family of one of your supporters, a young person, young man, I think he was like 30, mid-30s. He was working with BAT before that, he worked with URA. I'm talking about John Bosco Chivalama. Yeah. This is one of your supporters who disappeared in 2019. Yeah. It's almost five years without a trace. That must be really deeply troubling, not only to you, but most importantly, those who are close to him, his family members. And so are other people that you know. As a leader of opposition, as noob, uh, have you kept constant engagement also with the family members? Some of them are breadwinners. What do you do for them? What do you tell them? Because more or less like they were on duty for noob, and then they disappeared without a trace. You know, Patrick, one of the uh, more compelling uh, statements has been made by uh, state actors on the part of government to the effect that uh, why do you lay a claim to the effect that these were our supporters but you see we owe a duty of care to each, each citizen whether our supporter or not but to be specific Mr. Chivalama John Bosco was our supporter and um, if you make a trace he even made videos um, supporting our candidate then and um, when he was picked a, a lot happened and um, when the family tried to make a trace they were lied to they were told to go here he's here he's at CMI he's at CPS he's at Chireka until they, they were lied to uh, a lot and they gave up the NUP summoned its capacity to make a trace, including filing for a writ of habeas corpus. And of course, court issued it, and it was served to all and sundry to produce Chibalama to no avail. The last hope of uh, getting Chibalama back to his family, his little children, was when the Prime Minister of the Republic at least made a confession to the effect that Chibalama is with the state he even uh, supplied the date on which he was picked and the crimes for which he is to be tried, including murder, including treason. And that's the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister of the Republic is not a small person. And being the head of government business is believable. We are still waiting. I even offered the Prime Minister to personally escort her to go and look at Chibalama, whether in a dungeon, in a safe house, wherever it could be. So that Consider I can go considering what family. you know about how Uganda operates, people with the power and those with de facto power, when the Prime Minister made that statement, did you believe her? Why not? Because it's a serious matter, and I believe she does so believe the same. 
but this is a very serious matter. And you see why I did believe her. When she first made it, it was in the College of Parliament. It sounded inadvertent. Then on more than two occasions, she did repeat the same on the floor of Parliament, so on the record of Parliament. So when a matter leaves the corridors and kisses the answered, it's a serious matter. I know. She and is more just, so from the She has turned it into a serious matter. I don't so know why I don't know why I don't want to speculate. And, and, but and I have the, a I have a feeling. You see, <laughs> if the earlier statement from the corridor was inadvertent, she could have come on the floor and instructed it. But she's courageously defended that position and said, Yes, she is a criminal. But the Prime Minister and her courts have no powers of execution. Let me, let me put it we like want this. Shibalama. Let me let me put it like this. When when Jesus Christ was being tortured on the cross and was feeling the pain, he looked up and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. I don't think she knew what she was doing with all respect. Just forgive her. She's but you know, <laughs> I don't think I don't she, think she she's been she's been consistent and uh, I respect her consistency on that matter. Now which is why in the last attempt to have Chibalama produced we're going to have her in a private prostitution to really appear as a witness because um, she has full knowledge of where Chibalama is. At the, the least, she knows the people who are arrested Chibalama. In fact, uh, that is what consistent. even the family members that we managed to talk to uh, said that uh, they have their hope in the statement made yeah. by the Prime Minister because he confirmed to them that they have Chibalama. So if we are looking for uh, a, 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 18 persons. But I, I was trying to look for, to, to th I don't know why I just felt like do I wasn't you, getting you, Because in this country, I know, I, I don't have to doubt, but, doubt I also, but I also know the, the the, there are people with power, there are people with de facto power, and sometimes this power can be somewhere else. Uh, with all respect, it happens in this country. So, the, the point but we want to is that um, as a Ugandan, uh, Kibalama is a fellow citizen. Yeah. Uh, I, I would feel better if he's back in, in his family and uh, he's taking care, Patrick, uh, doing his I duties. I have visited with all these families. You will have an idea um, what these families are going through. I have visited with the mothers of some of the mothers, the wives the little children that are demanding to see their, their fathers to no avail. Um, Damolila was arrested with his son in broad daylight in the morning at Kiseka market. They were taken with their with the clients because they picked him from the shop in broad daylight with some of his clients who had come to buy uh, merchandise from his shop with his son. They were both taken and the son Testifies that they were badly beaten, later separated with the father, and uh, in the next room he could hear the screams of his father until dead silence. That was the last out of his father. He was later driven in the middle of the night and dropped somewhere in the Boyogedele and left on his own. But he never seen his father again. They were arrested together. He's alive. We have had testimonies of families. Patrick, a human being is not icy that they melted. So your, a description, human being. your description sounds like we are living in a real pariah state, you, you see, devouring on its own people. Th that's why I have been consistent in asking that is there no one answerable in the Ugandan state? Is there nobody? with the capacity, with the duty, because we only capacity is the duty. So you have a minister for internal affairs. You have a minister for security. You have a minister for defense. All these together in charge of all manner of uh, paramilitary and official state. They should come out and answer to the disappearance of these persons. Well, when they refuse to answer you at the floor of parliament, where actually your colleagues and they are mandated to do so, then actually... You see, they when, when, when they don't answer, that's another step. Because, you see, if you don't answer, it doesn't mean lack of knowledge. What happened? We would sit down with the families and take the next step. Because 
we know these were arrested by government agencies, the families, the friends, the neighbors. We have a case of one of the victims from Mukono in Champisi, where even the diesel of uh, the sub-county is full aware of what happened. They have been given names of those who were involved in arresting them from, uh, from Nansana. The, the two victims from Nansana, we have names uh, of persons who were involved. We have cases, we have a case of one of the victims uh, where family, family members were taken to CPS in a particular room and a ransom was taken from them with a the promise that their loved ones are going to come back. We have names of uh, persons who took money from them. So these are very serious matters. And all along I thought that in this government there are serious persons that will step up and say, we want to have this marriage conclusion. But somehow, so th there are state, there, there are state agencies and, and departments, for example, the Uganda Human Rights Commission, um, they are actually mandated to look into this issue uh, more deeply because that's their role, defending rights. How far have you gone in a conversation with the Uganda Human Rights Commission? What do they tell you? Uh, you know, Patrick, um, I, I don't know what to say about this uh, agency. I know the actors there. I was even involved in vetting them at Parliament. Some of the commissioners uh, are potentially honorable persons. My feeling is that uh, uh, it's been appropriated also and captured and rendered incompetent. It was the truth, and therefore it's now um, a toothless dog. Um, all it can do is to probably lick food and survive. But the capacity to do and act on this, their mandate from the Constitution doesn't exist. With due respect to the <coughs> there, the, the, the person they respect, like, I mean, um, Mr. Kaheru is, you know, a very decent man. Uh, there are others like uh, my sister, Shifra. We suffered together, in, you know, for years. Uh, and others. Uh, what, are I, <coughs> what, I've also, <coughs> what I've also let, let me finish this. Yes. That, that, um, in our interaction with the families, mm -hmm. and our interaction with them as NUP, they have been casual, unfortunately. Extremely casual. And indeed, in one of the incidents we are investigating, one of the commissioners suggested to one of the families that how much money can they settle for to have this matter uh, completed. What? Yeah, yeah. The, we so have this on record. And, and so we are interested in understanding whether now the commission is being used to cover up for these very grievous, you know, violations of human rights and causing disappearances. So we are keenly following each of these cases. I've, I've, also, heard informally, I've also heard informally yeah. that you have not given the commission all the necessary information for them to work with. No, in terms of no, but what do you want me to say? I don't know. That's what that's what I've had. I probably, that, that probably we, have had we, that too. We actually get out of our way and do the work of the commission. The commission has a duty to investigate on its own emotion. Even if he has something to do with the human rights I mean violations, to step out. But this time around, information has been totally awash in the public media. The contacts of family members were supplied. So what more do you do that we go out of our way and investigate for the commission, therefore the commission, and then give them a report? Is that what you're saying? I think the commission um, uh, has better serve its legacy by admitting to failure. Uh, but every time they come out to hazard an explanation, they look shabby. And I would kindly advise them to, uh, to be kind enough to their legacy and say things went a wall. Otherwise, um, they look shabby. And, and when the chairperson came out to even state 
that is, some of these people don't even exist. That they were the low, that they were the lowest, that the lowest they could sink to, and I thought she would throw in the towel. Because um, the families looked at her make that proclamation, and they even saying that she's going to close the file. I think she, her legal is best served when she instead closes the office than the files, hand over the keys, and take leave. You know, you are a honorable member of parliament, a leader of opposition, with a lot of respect even across the aisle. And the person who can be believed. Sometimes you share with the uh, people who are running the affairs of the country, at an inf informally, you know, as colleagues. What do they tell you? They have a sense of frustration themselves that maybe power is somewhere else and they are too, their hands are tied. I am very sure, Patrick, in your humble orientation growing up, when a neighbor or a friend makes a complaint against you and you listen, what do you do? You wait for them to come to you or you reach out. I'm still waiting for that courageous, strong man or woman to step up and say, hey, Matthias, can we have this conversation about these challenges? This is our country. We have only this one country called home. And we cannot allow ourselves to be haunted by these. We are leaders in this country. We are leaders of the opposition. You have raised very grievous claims against the state. But the state is not a building. There are individuals. Probably there could be individuals in the state system that could have committed these atrocities. I'm waiting for that honorable gentleman or woman to step up and say, we can deal with this. Do you have a feeling that uh, the parliament across the divide is devoid of men and women of good character and substance and empathy? Who could have courage and, and talk about these things as Ugandans at the end of the day? No, make Ugandans make no mistake, Patrick. The far from what people might think, there are so many colleagues from across the right of the speaker that think the way we do uh, from the NRM party, that think the way we do that something must be done about this. But they have leaders. I'm very sure they're waiting for. They are leaders. The reason why we have leadership at every stage. They cannot wisely can step up when they have leaders who must come out. Because when you are a leader, you have access to information, uh, more information than the ordinary member. And uh, it would be an act of wise aching for an ordinary member to step out without tacit or express permission uh, from their side to act on anything. Okay. So I can understand their inability to step up. So I am waiting for uh, either government minister or even the, the vice president or the prime minister <coughs> because you cannot put that to the, to the presiding officers. They are facilitators or adjudicators in a complaint. And as far as I'm concerned, they have played their part. And that's all they can do. If the government side obstinately refuses to make a response, they have a duty to continue asking these questions until answers are supplied. There's no space for denial. There's no space for refusal. And they, they, they become and tell, tell a lie on the floor of parliament. You can have a, a lie on the record of parliament. All right. Honorable Matthias and Poga, hold on to your point because we are going to take a break. When you come back, we'll try to shed a light on your two years and a half in the leadership of the opposition, but also you have been able to travel across Uganda. What have you seen and what have you heard? We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Kamara. My guest tonight is Honorable Matthias Simpuga, the leader of opposition in Parliament. We have reached that point when you also have to have your say. You're going to see the numbers on the screen displayed. You can pick your phone and call us. Maybe you have a question or a comment to make. And um, maybe you have uh, a disagreement with the Honorable Matthias Mpuga, which is okay, but remember to disagree with respect, if you have to disagree. I, Honorable, I know you have made two years and a half or thereabout as the leader of opposition. It's a huge responsibility and a huge mandate. Um, so you think 
when you started this journey, you have achieved what you wanted to achieve as a leader of opposition? Oh, well, uh, Patrick, it will be some time in December when I'll be two and a half years into office. It's been a well, huge responsibility on my shoulders, but also a huge opportunity for me uh, to be able to lead um, my colleagues, to represent my party, a very young party with a lot of promise, uh, to showcase that we actually are able to appreciate how a nation is run, be able to make our contribution to the growth of this country, even when we are largely disagreeable with the way the government is run. It's not easy, Patrick, to be to lead the opposition in this country. First of all, a divided opposition. Uh, secondly, um, divided, but also with some members of the opposition playing ball with the ruling party, but they still claim to be opposition. Um, Double-colored opposition, in other words. Uh, it's been Hachurian, uh, but I must state that um, we've made some steps and note that we have fully met um, our expectations or even the expectations of the citizens. But by and far, we have kept hope alive. What, what That's do you, for me what do you, most you have important. You have used the word there, but my mind just stuck on it, mm. the double-colored opposition. What do you mean? You know, public's not, I mean, you are in, in, in public space and you consume and share a lot of information with the public about how political parties in this country run. So you are a member of the DP. So your party president is in government that is persecuting the opposition. And you have some of the DP members saying they, are, they do not agree with the decision, let alone the actions of their party president. But they are part of the six party platform of the opposition, to which Matthias Impuga is lead of the opposition. So you have uh, members of uh, the uh, UPC in the same space. With you? With me. And now lately you have uh, an, a very unfortunate event of the divisions in the second largest party on the platform, the FDC. So that really requires some skills to be able to keep the boat afloat. But I'm saying that what is most important at this stage is to keep the promise and hope of the nation alive, namely that uh, so the divisions are only with some leaders for their reasons, but the people are united to a better Uganda through the opposition. That for me is the hope that we keep. As so when, 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 for example, the Forum for Democratic Change is going through a tumultuous time, does Noop sort of make a charm offensive to woo them to your side or you, you know, is, is that the moment to be opportunistic? It's not, to be opportunistic? A, it's not necessarily an invitation, but a red flag as to the space in which we operate. Um, I, uh, as NUP, that never aroused our curiosity to make a harvest. You cannot harvest uh, in that kind of situation. Political, you know, persuasions, um, political association should be an act of free will, not an act of pressure and fear. So therefore, we do not pride in the fact that um, the FDC has issues. In fact, we are very concerned that uh, that undermines the quest uh, of uh, the opposition platform to work together. It in a way sets us back in the manner we wanted to operate as NUP. What, what do you make of uh, your colleagues um, in the opposition, including other parties, when they are being accused of lack of integrity as if the allegations are they have put a price on themselves and we're not just talking about regular people in the party we're talking about at the highest level of politics that somebody has put a price and that somebody there's a deficit of integrity in them and yet those could be the alternative leaders of uganda what does that tell us about the country we are in and the politics we are playing you know patrick matters of personal property are real matters that really undermine progression, they undermine effort, they undermine sacrifice, 
and everyone should be concerned when they are raised. Uh, but because um, nobody has come out to make a confession or nobody has been charged and therefore conclusively investigated, it gives the bad test, uh, you know, in this space. Uh, all I can say is that all of us are charged with a duty to really understand why we are in this space. And there's a choice of belonging. If you believe that the other side of the bread is buttered, you don't have to eat both the buttered and the dry. And uh, for me, I have respect for those who make the choice to say, I have moved. Then I'll speak to you aware that you belong to this side. But I have a very huge challenge to speak to you not aware of where you belong, when actually I suspect that you are speaking to me in, um, in the tongues. So, Person probity uh, undermines growth of organizations, it splits organizations, and the fissures that uh, you know, exist in the FDC and DP uh, also consume our time because then we have to work around all these actors to see whether we're able to bring them to the center. You consume time, you, a lot of energy is lost, uh, trust is lost, because these are matters you run and sacrifice because of trust. So, so. Uh, the, the Electoral Commission the other day um, issued a roadmap uh, to the 2026 general election. Uh, do you think it would be good moving forward for you to consolidate your, your political force energies and maybe take on the NRM juggernaut as a united force of members of, uh, you know, forces of change? Don't miss his words, Patrick. There's no NRM juggernaut. It is. We're talking about if they have been around for 40 years. The fusion over the party <laughs> and the state cannot create a juggernaut. It just creates impunity and militarism. So, if you're asking all of us how we're going to comfort the military, is a matter that Parliament is invited to. Every confront. every government anywhere in the world, if they are in the power, even if it were you tomorrow, you will stay in the business of retaining that power. That's what they are trying to do. Uh, and perhaps they are using all, all every options are available. You, you can't to, use. To retain power. Uh, you cannot use extra constitutional means, and then you still claim to be legitimate. It's clearly be uh, trying to uh, to accept to to plant seeds of impunity, and then fail to build a durable constitutional order, which is our quest uh, as Ugandans. And you cannot state that all all countries know we have truly democratic nations in this world. And uh, it would be an insult on the integrity of those citizens that have run elections free and fair. The losers squarely acknowledge the loss, go back and plan, return, come to power the following uh, turn. They are there. Those nations are there. The nations that have functional institutions, where you do not have a brazenly partisan electoral commission, you know, they, they are there. When a electoral commission can stand up to the state actor and say, this is not your space. So Uganda is a unique act, and all of us must work to make sure that we roll back on the structure of the state, on the way the two commission works. These are very serious matters if you're going to talk about elections, and therefore call the NRM juggernaut. It's just impunity and gunmanship. Let me change gears now, and, and we want to hear from your own, if you can, maybe a report of sorts. Mm -hmm. You've been able to traverse Uganda, mm -hmm. and... Um, just tell us what you are able to see on what you are able to hear from the people you met. Every day, um, Patrick, I step out to go and undertake um, these uh, excursions. I return home stressed, you know, not because of the long journeys and the potholed graveyard-like roads, but stressed with the fact that you, you find abandoned citizens, you find abandoned communities uh, to which um, regime actors, uh, RDCs, this one, whatever, claim that they are supporters of the ruling party. It's very depressing that you find communities with abandoned schools, with uh, pupils and teachers sitting on logs and stones and, you know, uh, all manual paraphernalia, and it's very pathetic. When you find communities without water, sharing water with animals, storm water, and these are very happy supporters of uh, the NRM in uh, 
happy supporters. So I'm talking about abandoned service delivery and uh, abandoned decentralization. Law governments have since collapsed. I want to challenge you or actually ask you to just pick your camera and pick any law government and go and find out what's happening in the law government. So now it's when really you describe a situation like that and yet it's the people of Uganda who are giving a mandate to people like you to lead, what will it take, Honorable Mathias, to have a vibrant citizenry with a civic engagement that is competent? Because if you get the people who have a higher civic engagement and they're vibrant, then perhaps they will not settle for mediocrity. Sometime last year, I did present a statement to Parliament about the shrinking civic space in this country. That included marginalizing of uh, media, uh, civic um, organizations. I mean, um, we, we are aware, for example, today that Facebook still closed. That is part of what I was talking about. Why we need to crawl back on the state not taking away that civic space is because through civic engagement, we are able to draw the population to participate in making key decisions relating to governance of this country, including capacity to ask questions to their supposed leaders and answer to their demands. When you disempower citizens through denying them information that they ought to receive, then you are trying to rule in the dark. And that contributes part of the problems we see. So we need to really work together, the media, private and public, to try and insist and decline the invitation to, to occupy this civic space by the state. When we involve the population, then we should be able to ask questions, people be able to vote with knowledge of why they vote, and to even see. You see, you go to a, con a, to a district, you go to a community, and I think it's the mandate of the member of parliament, for example, to supply medicine in their hospitals, far from the truth, when actually they're not aware that there's a government which they subscribe taxes and that government must, as of necessity and duty, supply these medicines. So knowledge is a problem. Of course, you're aware of our levels of uh, literacy, literacy levels, and then if people are illiterate, and then the literate and knowledgeable cannot access them because the state inhibits that. So you have a problem. So it is a fight all of us must be a part of, to be able to arouse uh, public knowledge and participation into this civic space. Honorable Matthias Mpuga, a leader of opposition, I want to thank you so much for having added value to this platform, giving us what you've been able to see, for us to hear your voice as a leader of opposition. We can hear the sense of frustration and disappointment from you, but also we can hear the sense of hope um, that comes from you. I know as a country we've gone through a tumultuous past. Sometimes we go through rough uh, times, but we always pull through. Are you hopeful? I never lose hope, and which is why I have a duty to live to the hopes of everyone. Hopelessness is no space in our view, and I want to ask of everyone out there, never give up and never lose hope, because we have only this place called home for which we must crawl back on anybody attempting to suffocate and attempt to develop and grow an enduring democratic space and a durable constitutional order in this fair land. What's going to be your parting shot? Initially, thank you for having me and sharing my thoughts to the population. Secondly, to ask of uh, all that have space, media, civil society, religious institutions, religious leaders, cultural leaders, speak out. There is growingly a deterioration of the manner in which the country is being governed. You see, the longer the stay of a regime, the deeper the rot. And now the rot is coming to the fore. We must stop the rot. And now. All right. Honorable Matthias Mpuga, a leader of opposition, I want to thank you so much for the time you have given us. You have listened to him for more than an hour. He's a man with the gift of the gab. He explains and speaks with a lot of clarity. Some issues he's talked about are painful to hear, but of course he has ended with a sense of hope, which is a good thing. I know Ugandans, we are a resilient people. We have gone through very tough times, 
but we always pull through Uganda. Even this, this time around, we shall pull through. Let us remember we have a good country and we're generally good people and we can make things better. There is a choice to do good or to do bad. But I beseech you Ugandans, let's choose to do good. Good night and God bless Uganda.